Anton Kex, welcome. The floor is yours. Let's rock and roll. Uh, hello. Uh, hopefully you can hear me well. Uh, the, yeah, the title is actually about the craftsman. And, uh, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm actually delighted that uh, we share the conference uh, today with uh, uh, Robert Martin, who is still sleeping right now, but still uh, he's here. And I uh, think maybe he will talk, uh, uh, talk something interesting about craftsmen as well uh, today. So uh, <clears throat> greetings from uh, Tallinn, uh, my beautiful city. I kind of feel like a, an a Eurovision con song contest <laughs> right now uh, because it's all being all online. I really miss you guys all being uh, right here in the audience so I could see you. Uh, but still, uh, in the middle of uh, pandemic, uh, this is uh, all we can do. So uh, let's uh, do it online. Maybe if you are enjoying it, uh, being on your coaches uh, as well. So what I'm going to talk about is actually from my uh, uh, very uh, pretty long experience uh, at Codeburn. So this is the company that uh, me uh, and my colleagues have founded already 11 years ago. Uh, just to make uh, the work uh, the way I'm going to talk about. So uh, our slogan that we put at that time was also like, like well-crafted software, as you can see. So, so we, we were all about craftsmanship uh, right from the beginning. So just to give you some context, so we are not a very big company. We are 39 people. Uh, actually, we are more than 40 people, but uh, 39 uh, craftsmen who actually do the uh, development and uh, we almost have no other roles so no dedicated testers analysts uh, project managers uh, uh, nothing like that uh, all about uh, doing the stuff uh, ourselves uh, the best way, way we can do and uh, we we have worked with uh, uh, most of the biggest Estonian companies uh, and uh, if also including uh, a lot of export uh, like including Russia, Japan, USA, Norway, Czech Republic, and uh, you name it. So uh, we have worked with a, a lot of big, uh, big customers uh, in uh, in pretty different countries. So and uh, uh, usually our customers are surprised that we can do or how much we can do with uh, with uh, very few people. So uh, we have seen projects where like there are seventy people, uh, like uh, and we we are able to outperform them with like four people on, on our side. So usually when uh, somebody comes to me and asks, uh, how can I improve the efficiency of my team? Like with like many, many people, I say, uh, let's start by reducing the team size in half. And then you can usually um, make things move uh, faster. So, and uh, I'm going to share uh, more of our secrets. So uh, don't tell anyone. So <clears throat> let's start with a reminder. So uh, our industry, IT, exists only because we support uh, businesses, governments, basically our paying customers. They pay us uh, so that we do stuff for them so they can uh, like automate their processes and uh, everything. And uh, despite that, we actually also constantly fight each other while doing that and actually wasting the, the money that uh, we are paid. So uh, the <clears throat> in the past, uh, there were actually only full stack craftsmen and uh, they were called uh, just programmers. So uh, those were the people who were doing all, everything. And uh, most of them actually were uh, women, uh, which is uh, unfortunately not, not the case uh, today. And um, here I want, would like to note that uh, actually uh, in the English language uh, word programmer uh, is gender neutral and uh, the same is for the word uh, craftsman as uh, for many of the like professions and uh, here I, I would I'm happy that actually in Estonia in a finno uh, uh culture there is no uh, uh, gender in, in language so it's much easier to avoid this kind of arguments who is uh, what is inclusive or not uh, here I would like to point out that, uh, of course, uh, uh, everyone are inclusive uh, who are in our profession and uh, we need to, all, all of us, we need to work uh, better uh, to, uh, to be poor, uh, worth of our uh, jobs. So uh, at that time, uh, you needed yeah, to work also with hardware. 
So this is uh, this also included this uh, programming and <laughs> craftsmanship. And uh, nowadays, fortunately, hardware is not our domain, but we still need to understand it. So uh, fortunately, we are not uh, dealing, uh, sitting with soldering irons uh, anymore. And but still, uh, to be craftsmen and to be efficient, we actually need to understand uh, all the layers of uh, of the work that we do and how our, our systems um, operate. So let's uh, dig in uh, a little bit into the conflicts and toxicity that we have now, unfortunately, in, in the industry. So uh, this picture actually illustrates uh, uh, illustrates it pretty well. Uh, here are the titles are developer and tester, but you can put uh, any, any titles above here because uh, most of the people who specialize, they actually uh, think uh, bad about the, the other group. So uh, it's also the same as in, in real life. So when, when you group people in subgroups, uh, they start to pointing uh, each other and like holding axes and knives like you see here. So uh, <clears throat> one of the first conflicts uh, that I have um, experienced uh, in, in my profession uh, were the uh, sysadmins versus developers. So developers at that time were mostly like uh, full stack developers. So there weren't uh, any other kind. But, uh, but there were sysadmins who were dealing with the hardware and the servers. And, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, this was the time when IT became bigger. And uh, the same people that I showed in the beginning, they couldn't uh, deal with the hardware anymore. So they needed to focus on, uh, on writing software. So, uh, so a special role appeared uh, called the sysadmin. And uh, uh, this is when the internet came, and uh, so somebody had to take care of the servers. Uh, sysadmins usually they hate changes because if some, something changes, then they need to do something, and people don't do uh, don't like uh, doing a lot of work. But uh, developers' job is to change things. So this is the conflict that is pre-programmed into these uh, job descriptions. And um, well, what, what happened is that uh, yeah, people started like putting this kind of pictures like I have here on my slide that there is angry sysadmins and uh, people started like uh, uh, differentiating themselves. So who they are and how, how they work. And um, uh, Agile brought the DevOps movement uh, that attempted to fix this. So, but uh, unfortunately we can say now that it uh, kind of failed because the idea of DevOps was that the, the developers would automate uh, all the operations so that there is no um, dedicated role uh, uh, of a sysadmin is necessary. So the developers would do, uh, do it themselves, meaning that they will try to do it uh, as uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, spend uh, as uh, uh, few time as possible on this. So, so they would automate everything. But uh, nowadays you can see job descriptions uh, that uh, DevOps specialists are being hired. And uh, this uh, usually means just a renamed sysadmin. And this is not what we are actually aiming for as an industry. So all these uh, new technologies like containerization, uh, containerization Docker, uh, Kubernetes, they are actually meant to uh, reduce the amount of work that uh, the operation people have to do, but uh, but uh, that brought us the different uh, side of the thing that uh, actually there are dedicated people now specializing in Kubernetes, for example, which is exactly what not what we want. But and um, even recently, I've heard this quote that uh, giving uh, admin rights to developers will result in chaos. So this is uh, a disaster. So developers should be, or the craftsmen should be responsible for what we do, including how we should start and stop our applications. So now there came the 2000s and uh, there was the rise of uh, database developers. Uh, actually, back in the days, uh, Oracle is a pretty old company. Maybe they started even in the 70s or something. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, they have invented a new profession and uh, it's called, it was called the DBA, Database uh, Administrator. So they also invented the phrase data assets. And the reason for inventing these phrases was to actually persuade the top level management that uh, database that uh, the organization is buying is actually really, really important. And uh, that meaning that it's worth a lot of money. So they, uh, they made it sound 
more important than it actually was. And uh, that's why organization also did not hesitate to actually hire specialized people to uh, look after the database and, uh, and the database developers. And um, when the database developers started appearing in 2000s, like a specialized database developers, they, uh, they actually, there was again a conflict of uh, where to put the business logic. So should it be inside or outside of the database? And of course, uh, when you specialize, you think uh, only about your sandbox and you leave uh, inside of it and, uh, and you want to put everything there. To, to have it under your control. If you don't control the application that is accessing my database, then of course you, uh, you don't want to have much logic there. You want to have everything in your control. And uh, that was the, uh, the reason for a lot of fights uh, during this time when, uh, when uh, database developers tried to stick everything into PLSQL, for example, and the uh, Java developers would just call it uh, procedures and that, that was uh, resulted in untestable terrible code but uh, uh, nowadays this one unfortunately is uh, uh, is uh, going away uh, this tendency and uh, but there are others that are coming instead so the database developers stayed conservative uh, they even uh, have seen pretty recently that they still like uh, even if they use any version control they use uh, like cvs for example which is an ancient technology and um, like uh, they probably like like the people who are still in a banking system writing COBOL, they probably will never go and uh, uh, learn the new techniques and uh, like the better ways of doing things. So and uh, the other extreme, of course, there is is to like uh, let's uh, completely ditch uh, relational databases. Uh, they were like uh, invented in the seventies, so. Uh, uh, let's uh, let's do everything with uh, no SQL uh, because it's modern and more cool. So this is also something that uh, should not be done. And uh, you always, as a full stack developer, if you understand uh, different technologies, uh, you can actually choose the right tool for the job. So sometimes MongoDB is the best tool, and uh, I have used it. Uh, a lot, but uh, sometimes the, the relational databases with uh, consistency and uh, transactions, they are really uh, much better for, for your systems. So, and there are other uh, separate isolated communities, uh, lots of them. So they're uh, in IT, so there are static versus dynamic languages. And of course, in a, a serious conference like this one, we know that the dynamic languages are for the kindergarten joking. Uh, then uh, there is the open source versus proprietary. So, uh, so like in the Java world, for example, the open source was uh, the preferred way for, for many years already. But uh, in the Microsoft world, uh, C Sharp, .NET, uh, long time, uh, they were sitting in a proprietary world uh, using only the technologies that Microsoft provides them. And uh, of course, it's changing right now, but still, these are the completely isolated communities. And there are very few like C Sharp and Java developers uh, uh, talking uh, to each other and learning from each other. So, and then there are like the Ruby and Python uh, machine learning stuff, uh, like uh, Java Enterprise that fortunately is almost dead now. And uh, the, if we take the, also the Ruby and Rails and the old, all the Node uh, developers, uh, they have um, been reinventing a lot of stuff that existed before them without actually learning uh, some of the mistakes that they should have avoided. And uh, now, for example, uh, they started valuing uh, things like multi multi threading and backwards compatibility uh, that, for example, were never a problem for Java developers. So again, the com communities are like not learning uh, uh, enough uh, from each other uh, when they are creating something new. And there, there are also the uh, completely different uh, separate isolated community of uh, game developers who are working in studios and they still don't know anything about unit testing and, uh, uh, and agile. So they are completely in a different world, but they are still writing code the same way as uh, uh, we do. And, uh, and there are also like the, the programmers who still program in C or C++ to the embedded development uh, uh, versus those who are actually already moving to Go and Rust. Uh, um, these are also like, uh, like uh, people who probably not unit testing a lot and uh, like doing uh, their old way of uh, um, doing things. 
So now fast forward to like 2010s. Uh, that was the race of the front end uh, versus back end developers. So uh, this uh, that was about the time when these terms appeared. Before that, uh, like everyone were just developers or just programmers. Uh, so even the word full stack uh, wasn't uh, a word uh, at that time. But um, then there was the front end uh, appeared. So actually, uh, the new trends in web UIs um, uh, brought a lot of new complexity to the application. So the, the, the expectations of users and uh, the customers who order the software uh, became uh, a lot uh, more complex. So the UIs are more dynamic, more complex, doing a lot of more stuff uh, compared to the web interfaces of the past. And um, that also uh, allowed some people to, to actually separate more of the UI and uh, backend uh, code and uh, use uh, different technologies for them. So before that, it was pretty okay for the backend developer to actually speed out uh, some uh, HTML from, uh, from their backend code. And that was all fine. But, uh, but then the more complex UI needs uh, arise, arise. So uh, people started inventing new technologies and new frameworks on, uh, on the client side. And uh, of course, um, at first, even, even I was propagating a lot uh, this uh, clearer separation uh, more, more than 10 years ago, I've looked at my uh, presentations, and, um, but I never meant that they should be done by different people. And uh, of course, uh, when the new generation of young developers uh, appeared after that time, they started to specialize in UI, for example. So uh, uh, UI seemed like a more sexy thing than doing uh, like backend and uh, databases things. And uh, of course, they started reinventing stuff. Again, not learning from, uh, from the previous experience. And, uh, and uh, they started uh, compiling, like, uh, like learning new frameworks uh, every, every month. They started transpiling JavaScript uh, to JavaScript. Uh, they started uh, trying to understand how do we unit test if, uh, if many of these people unit test at all. And this kind of things that were already like clear in uh, other communities. And uh, nowadays, actually, we can say that backend developers, if, if you call yourself a backend developer, then you're like, a, can kind of reduce to just the API developers. So you're only expected to spit out some JSON and uh, don't think much about how it's used and whatever. So that is, again, not, not the way how do you write um, uh, really efficient uh, and pro productive uh, code. So uh, the, there was also like a lot of fashion uh, uh, related to this uh, web development uh, stuff. Uh, like with, uh, with the backend developers, as I said, they, uh, they are like the new dinosaurs uh, when in the 2000s, the dinosaurs were the uh, database developers. So now the backend developers are the dinosaurs and, um, and the, the sexy and fashionable ways to do the front end, only front end and specialize in it. Of course, uh, any specialization, as I said, uh, results in uh, in you like uh, thinking only inside of your uh, sandbox and not thinking where is the exactly the best uh, place to put your logic or code that uh, that ne needs to be uh, developed for the end customer. So, and then at the same time, there was another revolution happening. Uh, the, the phones got uh, smaller first and then larger again with uh, bigger screens and touch screens and stuff. And uh, there was a really interesting moment, like when in 2007, the, the Steve Jobs was presenting the first iPhone. Uh, he said that, uh, that uh, the full saf Safari engine is inside of the iPhone. And so you can write amazing web 2.0 and Ajax apps that look exactly and behave exactly like apps on the iPhone. So that was the probably the answer or anticipated answer to the question, how do you put apps into the iPhone? And the first iPhone, if you remember, did not have any app store, did not have any external apps, only the internal ones, but it had the full browser. And the vision was that, uh, that the people and also for security the people would write web apps and uh, they could be accessed on the iphone and uh, that works pretty well i uh, worked pretty well but uh, until there was uh, a jailbreak and jailbreak actually came pretty soon and uh, 
uh, it built also a community of people who tried to reverse engineer the the apis of the iphone and try to create the apps uh, using the same tools as apple is using to build their apps uh, that was an interesting uh, time for for hackers and reverse engineering uh, people but uh, Apple noticed that, that there is now a huge community and there are a lot of unofficial apps are coming. So next year they came with the App Store. So they had nothing to do and uh, because uh, they saw that uh, otherwise they would uh, lose the momentum or lose control. So they created the App Store and they changed the history with that. And now what happened is that uh, uh, every like developer or like a lot of our, even our customers, they come to us and say, hey, we want mobile apps. But, uh, but the, in, the, in reality, this is uh, uh, not always the case that uh, your uh, uh, service should have a mobile app. So, uh, but uh, nowadays, unfortunately, every website creates their own mobile app that needs to be downloaded. Uh, and uh, like they don't do anything much more than just download the content later from the web and show it to you. So, so actually most of the apps that uh, are there in the app store right now, they are not uh, necessary, they're not needed. They are, don't do anything more than, uh, uh, than the browser. So, so and, and unfortunately it also brought a lot more specialization to us. So uh, that brought us the split communities of uh, iOS and Android, and at some point the Windows Phone developers that also, again, they were specializing and uh, rebuilding stuff that was already done before them. So uh, <clears throat> even uh, when uh, Google bought the company called Android, uh, the, the original idea for the Android uh, platform was to actually reuse the popular language uh, called Java and to make uh, the uh, make use of the big uh, community of developers that are already available for for Java who who know Java and start um, let them start building the mobile apps uh, for mobile phones. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately. Uh, a lot of Android developers nowadays, they have never written any backend code in Java or uh, nowadays it's more in uh, Kotlin. And, uh, and actually they still now reinvent what backend developers did for years. They, uh, they uh, like face the same problems. They uh, like try to automate the testing. They uh, try to uh, invent, like invent new like languages and patterns and uh, so forth. So uh, unfortunately, now um, many companies uh, need to re-implement uh, the same UI at least three times uh, for, for like, for example, web, uh, uh, Android and iOS. Fortunately, Windows Phone is gone for now, but uh, maybe it's coming back at some point. Uh, there are still this uh, Windows Universal app format that, uh, that Windows Phone has uh, introduced. And, uh, and usually these are done by separate teams producing different bugs and uh, different like uh, deficiencies in, in this, uh, in this uh, separately built UIs. So, uh, and then uh, if you imagine that the same organization also uh, needs to employ the backend developers or uh, even worse, the microservice teams where uh, every microservice is uh, handled by a separate team, so uh, imagine how many people you need to create even the basic uh, service uh, nowadays. And uh, this is like, uh, I call it a waste of resources, a uh, waste of time, a uh, waste of everything. So if you do it full stack, uh, then you actually uh, know uh, what kind of logic do you put where. Uh, you don't put your logic too much uh, in, in the UI. Uh, you try to concentrate it in the correct place, whether it's a database or, or the backend, or maybe UI in some places, if it's usually, if it needs to be on the, on the client side. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and you design the system correctly so that uh, you don't uh, re-implement stuff uh, too much. Let's look also at these uh, popular mobile development languages now and uh, Kotlin and Swift, uh, they actually have more in common than uh, they are different and uh, they were uh, actually developed uh, almost completely separately and uh, like the designers of the languages came up with a lot of similar features. 
but what uh, but there are also some notable exceptions like one of the exception <laughs> is the checked exceptions like kotlin uh being a language that came from the java community uh, has learned uh, uh, that the uh, checked exception in the code actually get in the way more than uh, they are worth and uh, try to abandon it compared to Java. But Swift uh, never had them and uh, because it comes from the background of object Objective-C and uh, they introduced the checked exception with uh, like uh, as a big innovation. So uh, that's the that's the interesting uh, like difference here that uh, shows that how communities are not uh, learning too much uh, from from each other and uh, that all can get uh, very far is that uh, you will be only like a, you will specialize in the end so much that you will be only like know anything about function x and uh, the other somebody will know only about the function y and uh, and you will think that you are different you will be point fingers at each other and this actually not such a big a joke because uh, now we have lambdas and uh, function based uh, like developments where you really are de developing only functions so so think about it do you want to be like uh, uh, so so narrowly specialized so imagine if you would go to a doctor and you would say hey, uh, hey uh, uh, and you will check only your like left ear and uh, they will send you to the right ear guy and say your yeah, your left ear looks great so uh, so this is the what uh, actually narrow specialization uh, is good in some some point when somebody as a full stack doctor already uh, knew whom you need to go to uh, because uh, the, the full stack doctors are really needed to actually diagnose and uh, do do this uh, routing and um, understand what, what the real problem is, what, what needs to be dealt with. So, and uh, there is a word for that, and it's called uh, over specialization. So, over specialization in IT uh, leads to inflated teams. So, you need now suddenly 20 people to build small uh, project uh, instead of like uh, only one or two in uh, in uh, in, in a more efficient organization. Then it uh, brings you a low truck factor, meaning that if there is only one iOS developer uh, in your startup and uh, they uh, get sick or whatever happens to them, uh, they actually, uh, you're screwed because uh, you cannot uh, overtake the iOS code. Uh, it was, uh, nobody else knows how to do it. Nobody else uh, have seen the code even. And uh, like uh, I've seen plenty of examples of that uh, in, in real projects uh, during my career. And uh, of course, the projects become slow and expensive. And uh, I'm really sorry for our customers who actually pay us money, uh, pay our salaries, is that they actually don't get a good bank for the buck uh, most of the time. And with the really big shortage of developers on the market, uh, uh, I think in most countries, uh, that is actually uh, like uh, we, we cannot fix that. We cannot just put more inexperienced developers in the market and write even more bad software. We need to be better, all of us who are already in here, before we can teach the, the new ones to, to do it the right way. So there is another related term uh, uh, called uh, overengineering. So this is exactly what happens when when what you do if you're overly specialized, you you build everything into your own small sandbox, and um, and uh, the all the all the uh, maybe some of the problems or things that uh, should be implemented in your system. Uh, if you have specialized team, they are re-implemented in every layer where the people specialize because everyone tries to fix it uh, in their own sandbox. And uh, as an industry, uh, even if you're not specializing still, we have a big problem with over engineering. Uh, I really liked it today's talk uh, by Kevlin uh, about uh, uh, decremental development is that you need to always think about not about uh, incrementing stuff and adding stuff, but also about removing stuff. So you need to uh, strive to find uh, simpler solutions. And uh, so uh, to solve this problem, the full stack developer comes to the rescue. So actually, we need to uh, return back to the good old full stack developer, even uh, if uh, they weren't uh, named that way before all the specialization uh, started uh, coming. 
So uh, the full stack developer is actually broad man minded. They, uh, they actually think uh, about the big picture, about the large things. Um, they are experienced in many fields and stacks uh, because they, they are not afraid of actually going from uh, one project or one stack to the other and fixing stuff there. So they actually uh, get the experience and they learn uh, a lot more than uh, the narrowly focused uh, like a single stack developer. So they can uh, choose the right tool for the job, as I said, so they can decide um, what is the best place for sol solving some of the problem because they are not afraid of these different stacks. Uh, they can learn new technologies quickly because they have seen many and, uh, and they actually uh, they don't have any need for blaming or finger pointing to other teams who are not doing their work well. So if you're specializing, that is a very common problem. So that you say, hey, my microservice uh, like was okay, but the other one uh, was not finished. Uh, so we couldn't uh, launch our whole system or the backend developers or the frontend developers uh, blame the backend developers for not getting the API ready. And uh, this kind of stuff will never happen because full stack developers, they do the development vertically. So they develop the feature, not, uh, not the only UI of the feature, not only the database of the feature, or not only the, like the, some like gluing code in backend for, for the feature. They make sure the whole feature, feature works. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what uh, agile and efficiency is uh, about. So <clears throat> I find that uh, interesting fact that uh, in uh, bigger markets or bigger companies, uh, uh, full stack developers are a more rare kind. So uh, uh, there are more specialization uh, in, in bigger markets and bigger companies and uh, meaning that uh, uh, this uh, size or the big uh, bigness of something uh, uh, makes you feel that you can afford being inefficient. So think about it. So um, even in a big organization, you probably can split your work in, into features, not by uh, into stacks. And you can actually increase your efficiency a lot by uh, having uh, full stack developers working there and delivering uh, features completely. And uh, of course, in, uh, if you don't do that, you become uh, much less important. You're much easier re replaceable and uh, you're like not actually contributing a lot to the big picture. So you don't feel even that, uh, that what you're doing every day actually is, uh, is important. And uh, that is a big uh, thing that uh, like reason for the demotivation. So being a full stack developer also means that uh, is actually based on a uh, very basic, very like fundamental practice from the extreme programming. And uh, this is the collective code ownership. That uh, means that you are not afraid of, uh, oh, the whole code base is yours. And as it's uh, everyone else's uh, in the team, and you're not afraid of going somewhere and fixing stuff uh, instead of waiting for the other team to fix it for you. So you build and learn all aspects of your project. Uh, you can contribute in any area and uh, you don't leave anything to others. So you're, you're in control. And this is the really good feeling uh, that you can have in your project. That, that is what makes you um, go to work uh, every morning uh, with um, like a good mood and stuff because you know that you, you can do stuff, you can fix it. And uh, of course, with power comes the responsibility, but uh, this is something uh, that, for example, I like, and I hope that most of the professionals, they also like, so they, uh, they can do stuff and they are responsible for it, of course, as well. So how to become a full stack developer? So a lot of people actually think that, uh, uh, how can I get so many stacks and different technologies uh, into my tiny head? So the, <clears throat> there are too many of them, too many of the new ones appearing all the time. How can you like know about all of them? But uh, the simple answer is that you don't have to know or know about all of them. Of course, it's good to have uh, uh, like, um, just to have a broad vision uh, it's good to like talk to other people attend the conferences to know what things uh, are uh, in existence but uh, uh, if you're working on one particular uh, product or project 
uh, you need to be a full stack uh, only in the terms of your uh, product. Uh, so basically, you know the all the stacks of your current project, and then you move to a new one, you learn the stacks of the new one, or you create the stacks uh, by yourself. But uh, uh, so it doesn't mean you need to be professional in everything that is impossible, but over time you will learn a lot more than the uh, narrowly uh, uh, specializing uh, person would do. So it's a collection of technologies needed to complete your project and uh, that actually switching between this uh, project actually makes you a polyglot so uh, you know a lot more programming languages and that actually makes you a lot better because. Uh, uh, you see a lot more technologies and you know the uh, bad and good things about them. And when you're inventing something new, you can actually uh, reuse the experience from other fields, uh, unlike the more uh, broadly minded uh, developers. So you, you learn the essence. So you know what, what is important in, in development, in programming, uh, yeah, about your code, your design, uh, that the code should be clean uh, and uh, like all kind of things, and you can apply it in any language and technology. So, uh, so it's technologies come and go. So it's not not a problem, and you still learn most needed parts deeply at, uh, while while you work with the things because you still need to solve problem uh, problems in in your code. So things like structuring, isolation, clean code, security, logging, automatic testing, simplicity. They, uh, these are the skills that you are after and not the Java, Kotlin, JavaScript, TypeScript, Python. So, so uh, if you know the, the basics, how to write good code, you can apply it in uh, almost any language. And, uh, and the deployment, of course, uh, don't forget about the DevOps. So you don't want to be called during the night when your software uh, crashes and so uh, you need to know how how to run it you need to know how to make it reliable uh, so that uh, uh, it will not need any manual work to keep it running so why you you can say so as i said that technologies and specialization uh, come and go and uh, uh, the thing that you're specializing at now is probably going to disappear after some years, maybe 10 years, but still you need to keep relevant at keeping relevant. Uh, the only thing to keep relevant is to actually uh, learn new things all the time. And uh, this is what is much easier if you if you're in a full stack uh, position. So then uh, a lot of people think that uh, artificial intelligence is coming and probably will replace uh, most of the work that uh, even the software developers do on a daily basis. So uh, if you're writing a lot of boilerplate code, then most probably that can be automated. Probably uh, more complex, uh, more creative tasks will be still left uh, to us, uh, the human developers. But uh, but keep in mind that uh, if you're uh, if you're a very broad, uh, <laughs> narrow-minded and uh, doing only very specialized things, uh, the bigger is probability that your work is going to be automated and uh, will become obsolete. So you need to you need to be uh, think larger than that. You need to be flexible. You need to stop learning. And uh, what I find that in organizations, these multidisciplinary teams, they actually actually have more uh, chemistry. They like each other more. They communicate more. They hang out more, and uh, that creates a more enjoyable uh, working environment. Uh, full stack developers also they are more useful in the organization so they are often uh, they can earn more and uh, not not uh, just because they are full stack but because they are much better than the others and these are the ones who actually can solve uh, bigger problems and uh, like smaller simpler tasks are redirected to specialized ones so uh, you definitely want to be that one uh, who can actually solve any kind of problem and then you will be a lot more useful and a lot uh, more well paid. So <clears throat> uh, actually your project is more, more likely a member on, on the project. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully you can still hear me said that my internet connection is unstable but uh, you are doomed, so uh, you, you really need uh, need somebody who can solve problems on your project. And some people would think that they uh, maybe this is uh, 
um, an architect on the team, but uh, no, uh, not if they over specialize in uh, architecture. So if they stop coding, if they're only drawing diagrams, then uh, they become too specialized and they, uh, they are not full stack and not useful anymore. So you still need uh, somebody to be like broad, broad minded. Side effects of uh, becoming full stack is that uh, you're more uh, pragmatic. Uh, so you don't jump for uh, like uh, every new, like fresh and sexy yeah. framework uh, and thing uh, for it just to be abandoned a year later and uh, you need to rewrite everything or leave with this uh, legacy code. So you like uh, look for proven things, you evaluate things uh, in a different way because you have seen much more things before. So uh, like uh, still I can say that many web apps uh, are still pretty okay being server side rendered because it involves a lot less code and a lot less complexity. And uh, like I had experiences of not being able to check in for the flight because there are some new refreshed uh, uh, web UI have introduced using React or whatnot, and that just uh, are written by people who don't know how to do basic error handling. And uh, this is like the actually the, the reality for our industry right now, unfortunately. So you know the cost of one, implementing things in one stack or the other, and you can choose uh, accordingly. And you care about long-term maintainability, and uh, you avoid uh, uh, those frameworks that are difficult to replace, basically. Uh, uh, anything that you take uh, that you use as a dependency in your project, uh, you should be able to replace it or to control it. Um, and uh, if you have more experience, you, you, you will do that because you know that uh, long term uh, it's uh, needed. So you also like need to remove this tease uh, from, from, uh, from this uh, phrase. So uh, you can build uh, and you need to build this um, can do attitude. So you can basically can do everything. You can do any feature. You can uh, fix anything. Uh, you, you are in control. And this is a really good uh, uh, feeling. So now let's uh, get uh, uh, further into the next uh, part is that about the communication. So you can see that uh, or actually we know that the IT people or developers, we have gone a little bit further in the uh, our evolution than the regular people, uh, normal people. And uh, that actually uh, leads to some communication problems. Uh, a lot of people know that IT people are hard to talk to, and especially the, the developers. So uh, the reasons behind that, actually, they probably not that the, all the IT people are bad at communicating. Uh, they actually, uh, many developers, they're really smart and uh, they have a lot of things going on in their head. Uh, the thing is that uh, many IP, IT people and especially developers, they are um, um, thinking in a more precise way. And uh, that's why it sometimes can be difficult talking with uh, uh, the, the customer or the end user who is not uh, uh, using very precise language and talking about like very imprecise things, but the developers cannot uh, write imprecise code. So our code uh, should always do something very particular. And uh, this is where the communication problems uh, often uh, come from. So in the teams, uh, often we have uh, different kinds of roles like developers, testers, analysts, product managers. Uh, uh, that's uh, about the not uh, software craftsman teams. And uh, like one example that I had in uh, like more than 10 years ago already is that in the bigger organizations, Swedbank uh, in the, the Baltic countries, there were like 50 developers uh, out of 700 IT personnel. So what are all these other people? So these are all the... Uh, supporting roles. Uh, do you know why they exist? It's because uh, the developers are not able to do their job uh, properly. And uh, <clears throat> so the necessity of uh, analysts uh, reduces developers to uh, code monkeys. So uh, the analysts let you not to think through uh, and uh, like testers allow you not to uh, test your own code that you're writing. And of course, this is all uh, reduces the uh, efficiency a lot so actually uh, if you're in this kind of uh, specialized environment with different roles it allows you not to develop communication skills well enough and uh, that is not good not nor for you not for the organization 
So that leads to the uh, broken phone game from a childhood when uh, people uh, uh, tell, tell you things and these uh, things get uh, changed and changed when people tell it to the next person until a completely different truth uh, reaches you and you develop uh, uh, something um, without the correct understanding of the problem. Uh, what I also learned uh, during many years in Codeborn is that uh, uh, very often if you are not talking to the right people, uh, if you are talking to proxies or middlemen, uh, be it a project manager or an analyst or whatever person on the customer side, uh, if, if they are not uh, making decisions themselves, then uh, they usually will not, uh, uh, will not uh, allow you to change anything. Whatever, how much you try to persuade them that there is a better solution for the problem, uh, they will not hear you uh, because they, they are just messengers. So always strive to talk to the right people and uh, without any proxies. And that means that the full stacked uh, craftsman also needs to do the talking and uh, with, uh, with the customer directly, not, uh, not to the messengers. And uh, testing, I already mentioned that uh, never hope that somebody will find you back. So they should be only the last line of defense and you should be testing and automating the testing of your code. Only like that, you can be in control and actually deliver the stuff that you promise yourself to your uh, customers. This picture is pretty old and pretty famous about also how... Uh, how uh, everyone on the team can see the things differently. And if you talk to the customer directly, uh, like for example, you, you can actually find what is the right thing that, uh, that the customer actually needs uh, to, to build it. So uh, of course we still earn good money and uh, producing wrongly results and inefficiently and uh, poor our customers who may, uh, pay us, they get bugs and wrong stuff from IT and they accept that because uh, this is what they get almost from anywhere, but uh, it doesn't have to be that way. So I think we really, as an industry, we can become a lot better in serving uh, our, like the real people on, on the street. So uh, Agile was uh, uh, intended to actually fix uh, many of these problems and uh, also the communication problems. And, uh, but unfortunately, uh, nowadays we can say that there is a trend of downfall. Uh, people now use the word uh, Agile without actually doing anything of what is meant uh, behind it. And uh, there is no excellence uh, which Agile is all about. And uh, it became a management password. So um, unfortunately, Agile nowadays uh, like is uh, ruined a little bit. So it's a religion that nobody knows how to practice. And, but we can do better. And when we started Codeborn, that was a little bit before that, there was a new manifesto was written, uh, Manifesto for Software Craftsmanship. And uh, I still like it. And I like the, the title of the craftsmanship. So we're not the developers. Uh, we are craftsmen and we do well-crafted software, meaning the technical excellence and we're adding value and uh, we're share sharing our experiences and all kinds of things. Um, uh, do you remember this guy, uh, uh, Steve Ballmer, uh, shouting developers, developers, developers on the stage? So I think uh, uh, we should uh, shout craftsmen, craftsmen, craftsmen more uh, because that uh, that word also it reminds us who we are and uh, we are not simply the developers or programmers anymore that's not not enough so software craftsmen should be able to talk to customer directly understand the underlying problem not how the customer proposes to solve it that is an important thing is that uh, as you remember in this three uh, swing uh, picture that the customer initially they usually explain uh, their proposed solution, not, uh, not what they really need. And this is your job to actually talk to them and understand uh, what, uh, do, what problem are they actually solving. And maybe you, as a professional, you can propose a better solution. Then you break down the problem into small chunks, write down the user-centric stories so that everyone will see the progress and everything is in, in control. And you design the UI flow and you write working code. And you, of course, automate the tests to avoid regressions when you're changing your code. And of course, you automate the deployment of, uh, to this, of the system and you evolve the system by refactoring it all the time so that it doesn't become obsolete and uh, difficult to maintain. 
And uh, as you probably have realized that the old fashioned software developer only deals with uh, that part. And, um, but, uh, but that's not enough to actually to have the efficiently see and have everything into your control. It's also more creative and fun that way. If you're doing all these things, uh, you enjoy your work a lot more, believe me. And um, if, if you're into startups, and there are a lot of them now, and unicorns or whatever, and uh, these people actually, uh, uh, when you're just starting, you need to be a full stack, a full stack craftsman to survive. If there is no other, other way, or otherwise, okay, you can of course uh, uh, take uh, talk to investors, get a lot of money, and then you become really inefficient as more, most of the traditional uh, companies. But uh, but uh, feel sometimes think like a startup. So uh, how how you can do a lot with uh, fewer resources and uh, and uh, fortunately nowadays yeah not many startups also can do that. But uh, but it also still worth thinking and remembering it. Uh, uh, there's also a quote from Albert Einstein, uh, this uh, actually attributed to him, is that uh, make uh, everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. So this is uh, can be a trap that uh, some of the startups can fall into. And uh, if you do stuff too simple, then you can get into that. So so you 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 you. Uh, your system becomes a mess and you cannot maintain it anymore. So the under engineering uh, is, uh, is another important thing that uh, you should uh, re remember about. And uh, this is the other extreme of over engineering, very common in startups and uh, slows you down when you write bad code. If you don't uh, do enough of the technical uh, excellence and uh, best uh, practices. So now I think we're running out of the time, but, uh, but uh, the thing is, yeah, uh, if you follow the, I'm really big proponent of the extreme programming and at, at Codeborn we have, uh, uh, we have actually proved that uh, uh, a lot of the projects can be done really efficiently, really cost effectively for end customers if you follow the practices, if you're not uh, cutting on them and uh, you are doing the stuff as a professional and you're learning to work on all the levels, including communication and writing code on uh, all the stacks. So this is, uh, if, you, if you follow this stuff uh, uh, correctly, you actually, you actually know how to be a lot more uh, effective. So let me see what this slide is not appearing. Yeah, so a good developer actually can be five times more productive uh, than the average developer that is widely known in the hiring community. But the craftsman can be five times even more efficient by knowing what not to do. And that is also like uh, that involves a lot of communication and uh, thinking on a bigger scale. So we not only write code, we solve problems and uh, surely you want to become one. So uh, the quote that I would like to finish with here is by uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, also a pretty popular one in the craftsman community, is that perfection, perfection is achieved not when there is nothing more to add, but there is uh, nothing left to take away. So uh, if you think like that, if you act like that, then you can create uh, very interesting things uh, that you will be proud about. So thank you for listening and let's be better as a profession.